Hey everybody, Dr. Avaizo here. In this video, we're gonna talk about cardiac conductive physiology. This is one of those topics, again, where you want to really try and master the basics here because as we go on from this video, the information is going to get you know, more difficult when you start adding in antiarrhythmics, different arrhythmias, right? And so by understanding this physiology, you can really get the right answer in a lot of these kind of nitty gritty questions where they ask about specific currents or action potentials. And so we'll talk a little bit about the cardiac conduction system, just high level overview. We'll go into the action potentials, which is really the, you know, the core of this talk here. And then we'll talk a little bit about some variables that can affect this. Now, the majority of these variables are really gonna come in when we start to talk about antiarrhythmics, which will probably be the next video. All right, so the cardiac conduction system, so just to kind of give you an overview here, we'll start with the sinoatrial node. So the sinoatrial node is where the electrical impulses are normally gonna be generated. And usually when we're talking about impulses from the SA node, we're talking about you know impulses that are coming out at a pacer rate of about 60 to 100 per minute. Now, because the SA node is where we're gonna have most of our electrical impulses originating from, you can see it here. Again, this is gonna be right atrium. Usually what's gonna happen is you can tell the patient has a normal heart rate when it's between 60 and 100, right? That's the pacer rate because most patients are gonna have the SA node pacing their heart, okay? And so the reason why the SA node is actually going to be pacing the heart or is it's gonna be the site where these impulses are generated is because the SA node fires more rapidly than these other sites here, okay? So it's gonna be firing more rapidly and so sometimes we say that this is gonna be an override suppression, okay? Just because it's overriding this whole system because it's firing so much faster than everyone else. Now let's just go through this really quickly. So again, we're gonna originate our impulse here at the sinoatrial node. That impulse is gonna go down to the AV node, the atrioventricular node here. What's gonna happen here is there's gonna be usually some kind of delay. And the whole purpose of that delay, if you can imagine, just imagine your atria, everything above this line is gonna be atria. Right, so everything above this line is atria, and everything below this line is gonna be ventricle. So when that impulse comes in, remember the atria in diastole are going to contract. Remember at the end of, particularly at the end of diastole, you have an atrial kick. And again, that's all gonna happen in diastole. Right, so atrial contractions in diastole, but remember ventricular contractions in systole. So during this period where this impulse is sent out to the atria, you don't want an impulse going to the ventricles as well. You don't want everybody contracting at the same time. You want the atria to contract and then you want the ventricles to contract. And so that's the whole point of this AV node. The AV node is essentially saying, okay, look, that impulse is coming in, but I'm gonna slow that impulse down. Okay, I'm gonna slow that impulse down. I'm gonna have a delay here so that the atria can contract first. And then after the atria contract, right, I have a delay here. So the atria is all done contracting. Now I can send my impulse to the ventricles and these ventricles presumably would be filled at this point and we would get ventricular contraction and that would be your systole. Okay, so that's the concept. So again, SA node to the AV node. And then once we get to the AV node, there's this his bundle or bundle of his. So this bundle essentially is preventing this impulse from going backwards, okay? And we'll talk in more detail in the arrhythmia videos about this. I don't wanna get too off track here. Again, just high level overview. It's preventing retrograde electrical conduction. And we have a signal that's going to the right bundle. Okay, so it's gonna to go to the right side of the heart. And we have a left bundle, which has an anterior and posterior portion. Okay, and again, we'll talk about this more um, probably in the uh, arrhythmia videos, okay? And finally, at the very terminal end of this, you can see these fibers here. These are gonna be the Purkinje fibers. And they're essentially used to transmit this conduction along into the ventricles. Now, what I was saying earlier was that the SA node is going to have the fastest pacing rate. Okay, again, it's between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Now, if for whatever reason, the SA node wasn't working the way that it should, the next fastest pacing rate would take over which would be the AV node, okay, which has a pacer rate of about 45 to 55 beats per minute. And this would just continue to go down, right? If I had, you know, some block here, some block here, right? Or these, for whatever reason, were defective or impaired, I would go down to the bundle of his, and then I go down to the Purkinje fibers. And as you go down, the pacer rate gets lower and lower. You know, you might have a pacer rate at the Purkinje fibers of, you know, 35 beats per minute, you know, just throwing a number out there. Okay, so when you see patients with really significant bradycardia, this is always something to think about. Is there some kind of block or damage potentially to these regions in the electrical conduction system is causing the heart to have a pacer, you know, somewhere
somewhere down in this region. Again, the pacing rate is not the same thing as the cardiac conduction velocity. So this is something that gets you know, really confusing. So let's just talk about that for a minute. So remember, the pacing rate is the highest at the SA node, then at the AV node, then the bundle of his, right? That makes kind of intuitive sense with what we talked about. But what gets tricky, this is where students get these questions wrong and where examiners you know, love to throw in this cardiac conduction velocity. Okay, so you can see here that the, the script is flipped, right? So it's not exactly the same. So the AV node is gonna have the lowest cardiac conduction velocity. The Purkinje fibers are gonna have the highest, right? But the Purkinje fibers have a much lower pacing rate than the AV node, which gets tricky. So why in the world do the Purkinje fibers have a higher cardiac conduction velocity than the AV node, for example? The idea is the Purkinje fibers can forward incoming stimuli really quickly because they have a lot of gap junctions. And the reason is you want the ventricles to have coordinated contractions. So when these impulses come in and you go through ventricular systole, you don't want one part of the ventricle contracting and not the other part. You need to have everybody coordinated and contracting at the same time. So you need very fast conduction velocities to accomplish that, to make everything coordinated, right? So it's got the key with the Purkinje fibers is you need a coordinated contraction at the ventricles. Okay, coordinated contraction. And that's why the Purkinje fibers have such high uh, cardiac conduction velocities. The AV node, remember, it's the opposite. The AV node, we already said, we want to delay the SA node signal coming in. If you want to delay a signal, you're probably going to have a slower conduction velocity. It's going to take longer to conduct that signal. That's the whole purpose of the AV node. Okay, and then the ventricular myocytes and atrial myocytes conduction velocity are sandwiched in the middle here. So another way to remember this is you can say, okay, I have my Purkinje on this side, I have my AV node on this side, and then I just write AV again, right? Like just like my AV node. And then there you go. Okay, so that's your cardiac conduction velocity. Let's just say for whatever reason, there was some block right between my SA node and my AV node. So let's just say I block these signals. So now the signal cannot get through very easily to the AV node. So what happens? Well, my SA node is still gonna have a pacer rate of 60 to 100. So the SA node is still going to uh, be sending signals to the atria. So my atria might be contracting at about 60 to 100 beats per minute, okay? However, I cannot get that signal to the ventricles. So what happens? Well, if you can't get that signal to the ventricles, right, the ventricles are gonna say, hey, we still have to contract, we still have to eject blood from the heart, okay? But we, may, we might not be doing it at the same rate as the atria, because our pacing rate is gonna come from somewhere else. This signal cannot get through. And so instead, the pacing rate will originate from the AV node. So the ventricles, for example, right, the ventricles, they might have a pacer rate of 45 to 55 beats per minute. So you can imagine the atria and the ventricles are not on the same page. There's gonna be situations where the atria is going to be ejecting blood against a closed valve, for example, right? And this is something that you might see. We talked about this before in the jugular venous tracing, you know, where you have the situation where the atria are, are trying to eject blood against a closed valve because they're not on the same page with the ventricles. They're completely disassociated. And so we called this disassociation a third degree AV block. And we'll talk about this all in the you know, our bradyarrhythmia section, but this is where there's a complete disassociation between the atria and the ventricles, when there's a complete block between the SA node and the AV node. And again, the classic finding on the jugular venous tracing are these canon A waves. So you have really high A waves. Remember, the A wave is when you have the atrial contraction, atrial systole at the very end of diastole. Okay, you have the atria trying to get that last amount of blood out of the, the atrium, and instead of it ejecting that blood into the ventricle, it's ejecting that blood against a closed valve, and that's creating a very high pressure, and it's, that's these very high cannon A waves, okay, which is what you see in third-degree AV blocks or junctional rhythms, for example. Just remember, when you're looking at an EKG, right, so if we're just looking at an EKG, I'm just going to give you a rough outline here. We have our P wave, we have our QRS, and then we have our T wave, right? Now, just remember what all of these things stand for, right? So the P wave is going to be your atrial depolarization, right? So atrial depolarization, which will eventually cause atrial systole, right? And the QRS complex is a marker of ventricular depolarization, okay? So this is when the ventricles contract. So this is gonna be your systole, for example. 
Okay, so there's ventricular depolarization, and then the T wave is gonna be ventricular repolarization. Now we're gonna talk about all of this in relation to these action potential curves, but I just want you to kind of be familiar with that. And then also just remember that this distance from the start of the P wave to the QRS complex, this is gonna be your PR interval. So let's write that in here. And this PR interval is representing the time it takes from the signal from the SA node to reach the ventricles so that they can contract. So again, it's this signal going from the SA node down all the way to the ventricles through the Purkinje fibers to eventually uh, cause ventricular depolarization. Okay, so that's the PR interval. So this whole signal from the SA node down to the Purkinje fibers, that's going to be represented by your PR interval. So if, that's, if that takes a longer period of time, you're going to have a longer PR interval, which is what you see in first degree AV blocks. Okay, so in, in AV block, that's maybe not as severe. Maybe we're just blocking one of these sites, but we still have function through another, right? That would just take a little bit longer to get the signal to the Purkinje fibers, and so you might have, you know, a little bit more distance in that PR interval because it's a little bit longer. You can also see this with like beta blockers, for example. So beta blockers can also delay your PR interval, right? They can slow down the conduction that's going through this signal, right? So instead of there being an actual block, it's just slowing down the conduction and that can cause a delay in the PR interval as well. And the last thing I want to talk about here is going to be the QT interval, which is going to go from the beginning of the QRS to the end of the T wave. And the QT interval basically represents the time it takes from initial ventricular depolarization until the end of ventricular repolarization. And we'll talk in great detail about that in just a minute.